today. We're observing the 37th anniversary of the January 22, 1973 United States Supreme Court decision Roe v. Wade. As we know, it legalized abortion on demand in our nation. Today, as we have for 37 years now, we mourn the millions of unborn children that have been killed while offering hope and healing to their wounded parents. Today's program will focus on those wounded parents. Today, we are gathered for the 32nd year to commemorate the loss of almost 50 million unborn babies to abortion. Have we stopped to consider that there are that many mothers and fathers suffering that loss? I don't think so. For many, many years, we didn't understand they were experiencing profound grief, emotional, psychological, and spiritual. Many of us even ostracized the mother, thinking of her as a murderer and that we only care about the babies. 25 years ago, a woman in Milwaukee heard the cries over and over and founded Project Rachel. Only in the past 10 to 15 years have many of us come to realize how widespread the grief is and have started to address it. Today, we have three brave ladies willing to share their abortion stories. The first speaker will be Pat Odom, pastor of Marysville and Dumas United Methodist Churches. Second speaker will be Millie Lace, the founder, director of Concepts of Truth. And the third speaker will be Melissa Ring, the director of the Save One National Outreach. Listen, and you will hear their pain. Thank you. Like many professional young people, I had terminated two untimely pregnancies before her. And I, in those months, since, and years, had had many dark moments convincing myself that what I had done was the right thing. But that night I was dancing, it wasn't about dark moments. I had a living creature of God in my arms. She even looked like me and had dimples and was absolutely beautiful. And God chose that moment to let me to take off the padlock from my conscience. I dropped to my knees, hovering around that life so beautiful that he had made. Like half of the women who abort, I was a following follower of Jesus Christ, a practicing Christian, a believer. I knew what to do. From that position crumbled like a child in the womb, I asked the living God, who already lived within me, to forgive me of my sin. When I rose that night, everything had changed. I was forgiven. It was 1979, and I could still remember the signs that said, Save your baby. I remember crouching down in the seat of the car, and I told Dale, They don't know why we're here, do they? For you see, I didn't think that I was killing a baby. I was just getting rid of harmful tissue. I had been taking an experimental drug for a tumor on my bladder when I became pregnant. My doctor said that my life was in danger and that my baby would be a monster. He said I must have a DNC quickly before the baby's heart started beating. I was seven weeks pregnant and a mother's health exception candidate for abortion, but the doctor never used that word. I was 25 years old, I was married to Dale, and we had a three-year-old son. I felt pressure to choose between the three-year-old I could see and the harmful blob of tissue that was the unknown. I honestly thought I had to have this cleaning out or I wouldn't be around to raise my three-year-old. My doctor sent me to a Planned Parenthood facility here in Little Rock. And I remember that cold table, the almost empty room, and the nurse said, it will be over quickly and you can go back to work in a few days. She was absolutely wrong. Immediately afterwards, I felt mental anguish and I started hemorrhaging. I wanted to punish myself during the next pregnancy and I repressed the event for over 12 years. 
I continually had many pelvic infections, endometriosis, and I had to have a hysterectomy at an early age. The nurse said this will be over quickly, but that's not been true in our experience. We will have regret for the rest of our lives. My name is Melissa Ring. My husband Mark and I lead an international abortion recovery ministry called Save One. It is an honor to be with you here today. Thank you for choosing to come to support life. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and you might have life abundantly. Sadly, abortion robs individuals of life and from living life abundantly. Weeks ago, when I began to think about this day, there was one word that kept raising to the surface, choice. How awesome is our Creator that He loved us so much that He gave us the ability to choose. He simply gave us His Word as a guidebook for daily living. As a teenager, I remember thinking that God's Word was restrictive and limited me from living life. As an adult, I can see that it is there to protect us and keep us from harm. His desire is that we would love Him, walk with Him, and that our choices would lead us to His abundant life. Each of us are given choices. Attached to each choice is a consequence. Standing here today, you may have thought of a choice that you have made that has drastically impacted your life. Maybe it's a good choice that you are so very thankful that you made. This year I will be 40 years old, and there is one choice that has affected over half of my life. A choice to have an abortion at 18 years old is a choice that forever changed me. I bought into the lie that abortion was a simple procedure. I was told that I would have an abortion on Friday, and I would return to work and college on Monday, and that my life would return as normal. As I stated, it was a lie. When I walked out of the back door of the abortion clinic in December of 1988, life had been stripped from me. Not only the life of my first child, but the abundant life that I had once known was simply a memory. My life as normal didn't seem to matter anymore. What do we want? Choice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Choice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Choice! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Hey, Dave Brown, Crusade TV, may I ask you a couple of questions? Sure! Okay, what brings you out here today? I'm uh, totally in support of uh, uh, the legalized abortion in America. I think until that kid's ready to go on his own, it's the woman's body. She can do with it what she wants. Do you consider a fetus part of a woman's body? Absolutely. Would it surprise you to learn that a fetus has its own blood type and genotype? Cool. And so it ain't going to make it very far without her. <laughs> if, if medical science determined that that were a separate individual, would you believe in their rights? Uh, no, it's got to make it outside. Okay. I mean, thank you. It's part of her body. All right, thank you. May I ask you a few questions? Okay, what brings you out here today? Um, actually, my friends are pro-lifers, and we came down to do some stuff in Little Rock, but I'm not, I'm pro-choice. I'm for a woman's autonomy, so I'm just over here. Essentially just supporting the rights of women? Yes, sir. And if it were determined that half of the children that were aborted would grow up to be women, would that change your stance? Um, no, sir, because all fetuses are part of a woman's body, and I don't feel like you can have will control every destiny unless you can make decisions about your own body. And if, if science determined that, that were in fact a person with a different blood type, different tissue type than the mother, would that change your opinion? Uh, no sir, I've taken college biology, I know all that, so um, it hasn't changed my, it has made me more pro-choice. All right, thank you, thank you. Hey Dave Brown, Crusade TV, what's your name? Kevin Brenneman. Mr. Brenneman, we thank you for coming out. What brings you here today? Uh, just here to show our support for life. And would you say that uh, a baby is an individual life in the mother's womb and not simply a part of her own body? Where does medical science from stand on that? We believe that from conception, this is a life. And medically, how could you determine that for one that would say, look, it's part of my body, so it's an issue of what I do with my own body. What evidence do we have scientifically to refute that statement? I would say we have two, a new separate being with chromosomal difference from, a, from its mother. There would be a separate blood type? From a separate blood type all the way down to genetic individual from moment one. 
And if you had an opportunity to say something to your colleagues, I noticed you brought some of them out with you, what would you say to them today? Just uh, trust that this is a life, and every life is special. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, Dave Brown, Crusade TV. What's your name? Kay Chandler. And judging from the frock, I'm assuming you're a doctor. I am. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. Actually, I'm currently just doing gynecology because the night hours are hard with my mom before, but I still much, very much um, enjoy pregnancy and believe in the cause of her life. And scientifically speaking, mm -hmm. would you consider a baby in a mother's womb a part of that woman's body? No, it's not. It's and medically, body. how can we know that that's an individual human being? Well, it, it has a different DNA. If you did a DNA sample, you would find that it's different, okay? They may have different, completely different genetic markers, you know, if we check for things. Uh, like we do BRCA1 screening for breast cancer. Well, for when, a mom might have positive for that, a baby totally different for that. So it's not, it's not the same. Their blood types may be different. You may have a mom that's A positive and you may have a baby that's, that's not, that's, that's B uh, positive. So it's, if, she, if she carries AO and the dad's B, then she could be a B positive. So it's, it's, they're different. They're not the same body. And medically speaking, doctors take an oath, essentially. The first part is first do no harm, absolutely. What would you tell your colleagues in the medical community if you had an opportunity to speak to them? Well, I would just tell them to really look at the science. I mean, if you look at the science, it's really not that hard to figure out when life begins. And if it's a life, then who are we to say this life is more important than that life? Absolutely. You know, one thing I've always thought, it, it, the life of an, an unborn child should not depend upon how much it's wanted. Amen. It's got value in and of itself. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you for coming uh -huh. out. Yeah, sure. Hey, Dave Brown with Crusade TV. How you doing? Great. Thanks, Dave. And what brought you out here today? Well, I'd love to give my testimony about moving from forgiveness to healing. Um, in 19, when I was a young professional in the 70s, I had untimely pregnancies and thought that was the right thing to do. So I had le two legal abortions. And then after I had a child in 1979, I realized I had done the wrong thing. And I knew forgiveness. I was already a believer. Um, the Lord Jesus already lived inside me, and I asked for forgiveness. But it took 15 more years for me to move that long journey from forgiveness to healing. Healing is when it doesn't hurt anymore. And through post-abortion uh, study groups, I lead one in um, El Dorado called Save One that Melissa represents. And I also went to um, Ann Dirk's Project Rachel. In a safe place, women, God just attends those wounds and cleans them out and makes those deep sores so they don't hurt anymore. It's still a scar, but it doesn't hurt. If it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have been able to, to do this today. But I encourage men and women, um, there are Bible studies, Mark Ring that was on the stage is just in North Little Rock, and he teaches men's groups where they can go through and give dignity and life to those children that are missing. If you could say a word to a woman that was facing an unwanted pregnancy or maybe a Christian woman that's already had an abortion, what would you say? Well, I was the latter. I was the Christian woman uh, trained in Campus Crusade for Christ, a Bible teacher, found myself pregnant at a Southern Baptist uh, youth camp. I mean, I was 25 at a Bible camp. Um, time will change that crisis, that pregnancy uh, God is in control, and it is amazing. Your life's not going to turn out exactly like you planned it anyway, so don't mess it up worse <laughs> with aborting a child. You're going to really regret it. At, on average, it takes women 7 to 12 years to regret it, and they don't know what that hurt stems from. And I would definitely look into post-abortion stress on the Internet and research it before I did anything. I didn't know it would affect me. I thought the, you see, the pregnancy goes away. But the child doesn't. A woman never forgets, and a man never forgets that child. You wonder about them, and they'd be 20 today, or they'd be getting their driver's license today, or yada, yada, yada. And you, can't, you don't have anywhere to say it to. You can't say it to anybody because you're not supposed to have done that. But for and you're forgiven, you're not healed. And so the healing um, and having a safe place at, at, at my house, it's at my kitchen table, and I take women through it and through a weekend and then different six, seven, eight, 
sessions, we talked through it. And I would strongly encourage anybody, whether they... I mean, I thought I was healed. Hello. But I wasn't. I mean, it's, it's a process, but there is forgiveness is at the cross. There is forgiveness. The night I realized what I'd done, I was forgiven. When I, I spoke here, um, I had a new baby. I was dancing around with her in my living room and rejoicing at being a mom. And all of a sudden, the padlock on my conscience went away. And I dropped to my knees, and I knew what I'd done earlier was wrong. And I asked forgiveness. I knew what to do, and I was forgiven. And when I stood, I knew I was forgiven. But it took 15 more years for me to be healed um, because I didn't know there was such a thing. The journey from being forgiven to being healed is so different. But God gets in those wounds. They're oozing, and he cleans them out um, and leaves them. There's still a scar, but it doesn't hurt. And so that, that's crucial, um, absolutely crucial. Hi, Dave Brown, Crusade TV. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for coming out today. What brings you guys here? Well, we were one of the speakers today. And if you would, I know that uh, the people here got to hear what you went through, but if you would just share for our audience a little bit of your story. Okay. Well, I'm Millie Lace from Wynn. This is my husband, Dale. And our story started back in 1979 when uh, I was taking an experimental drug for a tumor on my bladder. And the doctor, t I became pregnant, and the doctor told me I had to have a DNC quickly before the baby's heart started beating. But I was seven weeks pregnant, and I was like the mother's health exception candidate for an abortion, but the doctor never said that word. He said that, uh, you know, I need to have the DNC, and he sent me to a Planned Parenthood facility in Little Rock. And I can still remember the sign that said, Save Your Baby. And I crouched down in the seat with Dale, and I said, Honey, they don't know why we're here, do they? We were married, and we had a three year old son. And I honestly thought I had to have the cleaning out of this harmful tissue, you know, so I could be around to raise my three-year-old. And But uh, I remember the, just the cold table and the almost empty room, and young girls were lined up afterwards, and one of them said, was yours a boy or a girl? And, and I lost it that day. I gasped, and I didn't, I, we didn't talk about it for 12 years. I cried myself to sleep every night. I uh, hemorrhaged pretty bad afterwards, and... Uh, just uh, wanted to punish myself during the next pregnancy and we were Christians and we were in church and we wore the mask every Sunday and now uh, I know why testimony is so important because once Jesus Christ does something in your life and even if it's the sin of abortion he will forgive you Amen. and uh, when when he when you experience that you want to share with others and what God's done he has taken the bad in our life and turned it for good and we opened a professional counseling and care pregnancy center in 2001 and when and then in 2003, we started directing the National Helpline for Abortion Recovery. And Dale, do you want to tell them a little bit about that, what we do? Uh, we've received thousands of calls from uh, all over the world, Europe, United States, uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, we refer the people or the callers to local help, uh, mail packets to them with a lot of good information where they can go get into a post-abortive Bible study. I also refer to Rachel's Vineyard. We also have... Uh, some care pregnancy centers that have their own three-day abortion recovery retreats, which we do, and that they're very successful. And just the experience of, hit, of someone uh, telling the truth about the abortion, admitting it, and asking forgiveness uh, just, have, just has a powerful effect on people. It lets them uh, release uh, the fear and the anger and the shame that they're living in just to hear somebody else admit, yeah, I've had part of an abortion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just powerful. Telling the truth is always powerful. It just has a, just a great effect. Were you surprised at all as a father, for the impact that it had on you? A lot of people don't take into consideration that each father is also affected by an abortion. Fathers, uh, they're a little bit slower about grieving and trying to understand. Uh, of course, it wasn't his body, but it was his baby. It just takes a while sometimes for men to come along, but men need to hear uh, women in a Bible study. That They need to hear their pain. They need to hear what they're saying. And I would like to give the number, if that's okay. It's 866-482-LIFE, or you can go to nationalhelpline.org. And again, 
it's so important to grieve your loss. Yeah, and so to give our daughter, Jill Allison, personhood and honor, that, that's when we came out of the denial. That's when we started beginning to heal and, you know, receiving forgiveness through Jesus Christ and His grace and the blood of Jesus covers all sin. And so, but to move through that grief is so important. And the, the sad part, as a professional counselor, I, I look and I see the women and men calling in and the grief is so complicated because, see, it couldn't be a baby or a life because it's legal. So then we push it down. So we call it disenfranchised grief because it's not accepted by society. And so we don't mourn. And so really, America needs to mourn to heal. And hopefully we could turn this thing around because once we heal, we want to get proactive. Hopefully we want to do something about it. Tell someone else. So we just pray that our testimony today will just have, you know, thousands, millions more to call in and uh, begin to heal and uh, turn our nation around. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Dave Brown, Crusade TV. What brings you out here today? Well, I'm Rose Mim, the Executive Director of Arkansas Right to Life, so I'm out here because of the march. And you come each year? Right, yeah, I organize it. So, yeah, we sponsor the March for Life, Arkansas Right to Life does, so that's why I'm here. And this is an important issue right now, especially with some of the changes that have happened politically. Uh, what do you see in the horizon here with the Obama administration? Well, unfortunately, it's a very bleak picture. This uh, president is the most uh, radical abortion as we could ever have had to, to elect in the White House. He, uh, throughout his political career, which is very short, he has opposed any restriction whatsoever on abortion. And now in his national health care plan, he wants the government to fund abortions, elective abortions on demand. And what can we as taxpayers and citizens do to help prevent that? Well, we just have to, to let our voices be heard. For the unborn who has no voice, we need to contact our elected representatives and senators. Uh, even on the local level, our governor and, and state and state senators and representatives to let them know how we feel that this is an important issue and that we need these, these children who are being aborted. Those are uh, taxpayers that aren't here, you know, to help us uh, sustain our programs that we need, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, those kinds of programs. Absolutely, and events like today certainly bring it to the public consciousness. I hope so. I mean, we've killed over 50 million unborn children in our country and still are killing 1.3 million every year. So this is an, an extremely important issue. The average American does not understand that we're killing an unborn child every 26 seconds in our country. And the toll is, it's taken on all of us. You know, there are consequences and we're all feeling them. So even if a person were not particularly religious, this is actually a civil rights issue. Absolutely. You know, even somebody who does not believe in God believes in uh, a, the worth of a human being over an animal or a plant. So certainly, yes. And we do uh, appeal to all people of all faiths or no faith, you know, all ages, uh, all races. You know, this is a human rights issue. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Dave Brown with Crusade TV. May I ask you a couple of questions? Certainly. What brings you out here today? Well, I've been here every year for as long as I can remember, and it's uh, to me an important way to uh, stand for those who believe that every human life has value and worth and purpose. And uh, if we don't do that, then uh, you know I think we are a part of the problem. And uh, it's very important that God's people who believe in the dignity of each human being uh, maintain that stand. What about a non-religious citizen? Would you consider this strictly a religious issue or even a civil rights issue, a right to, to well, life? It's, it's a human rights issue. Uh, certainly as a Christian believer, from my uh, faith perspective, it matters a lot because I believe that every person has been created by God. But even if I were not a Christian, uh, I don't know how it would be possible for me to believe that some human beings are worth more than other human beings and that some people are worth less. That's what it really comes down to. Do we believe that every person has equal standing, equal value, equal worth? We do or we don't. And if we don't, I find that hard to justify. I'd love to see how someone explains that they may feel like that their life has more value than the life of somebody else. And this may be a tricky question, but uh, any presidential plans in your future? Well, not right now. I'm busy as I can be uh, doing what I am doing, and I'm not ruling anything else out for the future, but I look at that way on down the road. Thank you very much. You bet. Good to see you. you Glad you're here.